Hi everybody, my name is Mike Dragalis, and today I'm going to be talking about Clojure. So Clojure is a language written by a guy named Rich Hickey in 2007. Uh, it's a dynamic list that sits on top of the JVM. It's a functional language, impure, so your functions can do I.O. if the type system doesn't constrain you in any way like that. Um, it ships with data structures that are both immutable, meaning once they're constructed, that's it, you cannot change them, and both persistent. So if you, I have the array 1, 2, 3, and I add an element, I get back a new array of 1, 2, 3, 4. The old one's still intact, and a new one's created. Uh, it has idiomatic Java interoperability, so you can make use of all the Java libraries that already exist very cleanly. And lastly, it has language-level concurrency built in. Um, it has concurrency built within in mind from the very start. I'll talk more on that later. Um, so here's what a bit of closure code looks like. And it's not important that you understand what this is actually doing. I more want you to get a feel for the shape of the language. So a lot of parentheses, and there's some prefix notation. And in other words, it's probably not something that you've used to solve real-world problems before. And so if I was to sit here and show you a lot of foreign language constructs, you wouldn't learn too much. But it's the ideas behind the language that are so different that um, Rich got right where a lot of other languages fail that I think you'll really take away something today. Uh, and the way I'm going to do that uh, is by condensing a lot of Rich Hickey's talks. Um, he's been presenting all over the place at conferences over the last few years, and he has a lot of interesting things to say, and I think they're worth looking at. Um, so I'm going to lean very heavily on what he's saying tonight. So whenever I present something kind of on his behalf, the talk name will be um, obviously in capitals. And I put the year after it, so that A, um, I'm not ripping him off. These are mostly not my ideas. And B, you can watch the talk later, because they're very much worth watching. So let's get into it. Um, the talk was, are we there yet, in 2009. Um, so he shows up at the JVM Language Summit Conference, and he basically posits that, you know, are objects serving us as well as we hope they are? They're certainly everywhere. We seem to be happy with them. But let's kind of keep an open mind and think about what it is exactly that we're doing. Um, we have languages like Java and Ruby and Python and Scala. Um, and we talk about how different they are, but really, they're more similar than they are different. They're all OO, mutable state, single dispatch type languages. And some people will argue that the differences between them are a matter of taste, that you can't be wrong when you talk about these things. But they're only true when they're too similar. And those three properties make those languages remarkably similar. We need something very different. If we keep making languages that are little iterations on what we already have, we're not going to get anywhere good fast. Um, so we're going to jump to somewhere totally different. And I think the way to get everyone on board with that is to agree what's good up front. The single responsibility principle, open close principle, all the solid principles. I think everyone in this room agrees that those are good things. So that's a good foundation where to start. Um, and the next question that I want to ask is, how often are we actually getting it right? How many times, you know, in your software engineering career have you said that quality on your project was at an absolute maximum? And I'm not really suggesting that uh, there were no bugs, but that every inch of your project was marked with your craftsmanship. And I think if you're, you know, you're really being objective with yourself, this number happens to hover around zero for most people. I really believe that. Um, I don't think we're as hard on ourselves as we should be. Um, I've done it once in my nine years of working on software, and I consider myself hugely fortunate to have been able to do that. And if you've been on co-op, you've learned the real lesson. And it's that software in the real world is an absolute disaster. I think if we're really being objective with ourselves, we're just not cutting it. Um, and I just, I decided that I don't want to be a part of this. I don't want to spend my life making software that just doesn't come out that well. Um, so let's step back and you know, ask, why is this happening? And the obvious answer is complexity, which is defined as many interconnected parts, compound thing. And it's those interconnections that are just killing us, because you can't take the thing apart and think about it independently. You can't debug it, you can't it separately, reason about it, understand it separately. That's really what hurts us. Um, and so there's two kinds of complexity that really concern us, and one of which is essential, which is the complexity uh, in the problem that we can't get rid of. It's why the thing is hard. And the second of which is incidental complexity, which is complexity that we create inside the solution space that's our fault. I don't really want to talk about essential complexity tonight because we know that the problems we solve are getting harder and harder. And that's just a fact of life, but it's the incidental complexity that we have all the control over. Uh, so a contrived example, because I had to have a cat in my talk, is that my problem is that my cat is stuck in a tree. That's the essential complexity. I can't get rid of it. 
but the incidental complexity is my solution. I use a jetpack to get my cat down. But my jetpack is broken, so I have to order one on Amazon. And, and the problems recur. It's, it's incidentally complex. So I have to introduce a few more words to use them properly for the rest of this talk. Um, so the next word I'm going to talk about is easy, which means to lie near. And I'm going to use it in the context of lying cognitively near to what you already know, free from pain, discomfort, and worry. And easy is a relative thing. So Abigail knows German. German is easy for her. It's relative. It's hard for me because I don't know German. And that's very different from the word simple, which we use interchangeably all the time. Simple has a very uh, strict meaning. It means not compound, lack of interconnections, lack of braiding, which if you notice is an objective thing. We can take two designs and say this one is simpler than the other one. Now, the Agile Manifesto will have you believe that simplicity is the art of maximizing the amount of work not done. And this is not true at all. This is some of the hardest work that we do, and in my opinion, it's the most interesting. It takes a great deal of effort to take a problem space and split it apart, and be able to think about those things independently, so that you can get um, the, the, the ability to reason about things uh, for whatever situation uh, happens to come up. The last word that I want to mention is complex. This is like the, the word of the closure community, kind of like monad is the word in Haskell. Um, and it means to interweave and intertwine. And it's a really old word, but Rich brought, brought it back because, you know, you can do that. And it sounds kind of, it sounds kind of evil, like I complexed that, I created complexity. So we like that, you know, when you complex, it's, it's nasty sounding. Um, so this is, this is the poison. This is when you take two things that are completely separate and you cross them together. And this is how you get software that looks like that broken down thing that I already showed. Uh, so why am I just talking about words? These things honestly matter. Um, we have to be able to embrace our constraints. The more you avoid your constraints, the more of a mess that you're going to make. And the constraint that we always try to run away from is our short-term memory. We can only talk, think about seven plus or minus two things whenever we're working. And if you sit down and you make a list of the things that you're thinking about, or all things that you need to remember when you're writing a function into a larger software project, it is enormous. It is way more than seven. Um, we're just not cutting it in that respect. I really like this quote by Rich. Um, Programming is about thinking, not about typing. It's worth thinking about for a while because it really digs deep into what we're actually doing. So let's decomplect the object because it does way too much. Objects are data. They are behavior. You know, what's the last one? Identity. Identity. Okay. Um, so, so what is data? Data is things like numbers and strings and collections, and behavior is obviously just functions. Uh, there is no explicit construct in a lot of those languages that I already mentioned in identity. Uh, Closure has something called atoms and reps and agents, and I'll talk about what that is later. So when you do this, when you create this beautiful line and leave that world of love, you leave a lot of problems behind already. You don't have the getter-setter argument that I hear, in, that I hear so much, and it's, it's such a waste of time because there is there's no setting of mutable data. It is what it is. There is no getting. We don't have classes that we hide data behind. Data is, exists as a first class thing. There are no mock objects. You know how they cascade once you start going down the mock object uh, route? There are no objects, so you don't have to worry about that sort of thing happening. Copying and cloning. Everything is immutable. We can just share it. It's all fine. It's all good. It's set. Um, a lot of the patterns that come up drop out because functions come as first class citizens. So things like strategy and visitor can be built right into the language and used very, very naturally. Okay, um, so I want to talk about some of the things that we use, choices that we make that complex our problem space. So variables. Variables, I'm going to posit, complex value, time, and space. And that values all by themselves are simpler. So what's a value? A value is an immutable snapshot. It is a stable thing that is agnostic to place. So consider the number 42. It's 42 here, and it's 42 in China. It's 42 everywhere. It transcends language. It's 42 in Java and 42 in Python. It's semantically transparent. It always means 42. And most importantly, this is the subtle point. It can be used to represent a point in time's relative worth. I can say that at a point in time, something was 42. But 42 is not directly associated with the time. Um, if I could draw a metaphor to it, it I don't golf, but it's kind of like uh, being on a putting green and putting down the marker where your ball is, you represent a point at somewhere, but you can pick up the marker later and just take it around anywhere. So it's not complected with the thing, you can pose it with the thing. So that's why it's complected with place. 
you have to go to the place to update the variable, the special place. There's no place where 42 is. It's, it's free of place. Um, oh, yeah. Um, what, what do these values actually look like? They're just things like strings and integers and booleans and collections. Not the functions associated with those collections. They just exist structurally all by themselves. They are not objects or interfaces. Objects can change, and objects and interfaces do not transcend language. That's why Corba died. That's why we use JSON to be able to communicate between uh, two systems, right? They transcend languages. That's why they're so terrific. So what do I mean by time? We don't think about that a lot. I'm talking about relevant time. Um, so I was here, and then I came. I was, I was at my apartment, rather, and I came here later to give this talk. And if you get time wrong, game over. It is the most complex thing that you can get caught up in. Values reject that complexion of time. As I was saying, they are independent of it. And at a higher level with functions, referential transparency is how functions also reject time. Same inputs, same outputs every single time. It's, it stays agnostic to uh, time and place. So I can make this very real for you, because that sounds kind of fluffy. At one point in time, Doreen is president. And at a later point in time, Derek is president. From that second reference point, it is if Doreen was never president. We have destroyed the past. What kind of a time model is that, where the past goes away? Stu Howley has a really good quote, the past doesn't go away because the future happens. And that's completely obvious. We are writing programs that do this all the time. Uh, so we have no past, but it gets even worse, because in the presence of multiple threads, we don't even have a stable present. Uh, the thing that you think you had <laughs> is a thing swept out from underneath you. The time model completely broken. I have an argument later that relies on this. Did I lose anyone? A little bit? Keep uh, going. All right. <laughs> okay, objects. I already talked about that one. We just we comply data, behavior, and identity. And you, just, you take it apart. You use data by itself, functions by itself, <laughs> identity by itself. It's very simple. Loops. Loops complex what you're doing with how you do it. How many times have you written this line of code written this line of code in your life? Every time you are saying, this is how I iterate over the thing. And it's always on you to do it. It's incidentally complex. And moreover, you can't separate the policy for iteration from the thing that you're actually doing. Simpler things to use are things like map and filter and reduce. Higher order functions so that encapsulate how you walk over the thing. Syntax. This is very interesting. So this is a function called greet that has a doc string, returns a friendly greeting, takes an argument, your name, and calls the stir function, hello, your name, or hello world. Um, I'm saying here that syntax complex order and meaning, and that data is simpler. Let's look at what data looks like in closure. Lists are denoted by parens, uh, vectors denoted by square brackets, quotes for strings, curlies for maps, and hash curlies for sets. Let's look at that same thing in a very different way. Notice that the parens are lists, and that the square brackets are vectors, and that the quotes are strings. Closure programs are solely represented by closure data structures. This is called homo-iconicity, and it's why I can go out and implement the language features completely by myself without waiting for Rich to implement them for me and give them back to me. It's what sets lists apart, this one property. Programs are their own data structures. That's why macros are so incredible. They can generate, um, they can manipulate rather the abstract syntax tree at runtime. This is the abstract syntax tree if you rearrange this from list notation to a tree notation. Uh, so he showed up at a Rails conference as a guest to give a talk, and he said, with conviction, I don't care how much you like the syntax of your favorite language, it's inferior to data in every way. And he's talking about simplicity. This is an objective thing. Um, I've just made the tip of the iceberg of this, stuff, this argument. I know you guys love pretty syntax. Uh, there's more to be made. Go check it out. <laughs> Inheritance. Inheritance <laughs> is definitionally complexing. Foo complexed with bar. You can't have foo without bar anymore. That's, that's it. It's, yeah. Replace it with polymorphism composition. Data. What's data complexed with? Yes. Poor data. Nothing. Data is not complexed with anything. It's so simple and beautiful. Stop hiding it behind classes and interfaces. You can just use sets and vectors and arrays and maps all by themselves. Um, I know that sounds scary, but it works out really well. You know all those scripts I wrote with our new classes? That yeah. Right yeah, you're on something. <laughs> <laughs> so all these things, 
they're single-threaded problems. We haven't even entered the concurrent realm yet. Um, how can we expect to stay, stay sane in concurrency when we've already messed up time uh, in the single-threaded world? Moreover, you might be wondering how these things got taken apart. The time thing is so subtle and brilliantly constructed. Um, there's a heuristic that's worked brilliantly for me over the last few months. Take your problem space. Ask, what is the who in this problem? The what, the when, the where, the why, and the how. If you find all these things and you pull them apart so as many of them as possible are islands, your design will come out so much better than when you started. Okay, uh, so immutability is fantastic, but we don't write calculators. We write programs that affect change on the world. We do I.O., we open web sockets. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we do immutability, which better be sane, and while I'm at it, I'll talk about concurrency, which is also represents change over time. So we want to model the real world. Um, let's talk about how we proceed. And I'm going to greatly simplify this, but uh, you know, forgive me. Uh, so perceive means to become aware via the senses. You're all looking at me and perceiving me. And it would appear that this is a continuous thing, but it's not. You're actually taking very, very fast snapshots and processing it. And the reason is that if you were to do both at the same time, we would be an absolute mess. So the spikes here, the low point, you're getting some data, and then boom, you're processing it, and you keep going very, very fast. And these snapshots are uncoordinated. You didn't have to ask my permission to perceive me. You didn't have to coordinate with anyone else to look at me. That's not the way it works. And snapshots that you're taking of me are stable. You can look at me and close your eyes, and as long as your visual memory allows you to retain that, uh, you, can, you can keep that. That's yours, which incidentally, as a human, is a quarter of a second. But for a computer, it's a heck of a lot more stable. Um, as I just said, it's independent of action. So you doing something to me is different than you perceiving me. They're two different things. They should be split apart. And the last subtle point about perception is that everything, every decision that you make, we are decision-making people, is always based on the past. There's always some amount of time between when you perceive something and when you make a decision about it. It has to come through your sensory organs and then gets up to your brain, and then you can make a decision. So that's, that's, very, that's very important. Uh, now I want to talk about identity, um, which is kind of, you know, we don't have a good definition of this usually, but it's something that you create in your own mind. Um, and furthermore, this, this thing you give identity to emits snapshots that you can perceive. And identity is really the aggregation of those snapshots over time. So we're outside, we're looking up at a cloud. But it's not really a cloud. It's an arrangement of water molecules. And they're changing, rather they're transforming their arrangement over time to different locations. Some of them are dropping off. Um, so you're looking at the cloud and it's moving across, but actually the water molecules are changing, changing patterns. And what you're seeing is the aggregation of those snapshots over time. That's what identity really is. It's not a continuous thing. Awesome quote. You can't correctly represent change without immutability. Does that make sense to anyone yet? It will soon if you don't. So how do we do concurrency in the mutable OO world? Is what we're doing a faithful representation? We're using locking and mutexes and synchronization. And it all comes down to that we're trying to play God and stop time. <laughs> and we know that we can't do that. This is avoiding a constraint. Right? The world's massively parallel. Many people can view a small number of people, or any, any arrangement, rather, but we don't have to coordinate with each other. Um, I want to show you one repercussion of what happens when you try to model the world this way. So everyone look at Derek. If this were an OO mutable state program, the Derek resource is under contention, and as a result, he's slowing down. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. That proves just how far off we are. You can stop with Derek, though. That was like, um, but yeah, like that's obviously wrong, and yet this is how we're modeling the world. Um, just to make this a little bit more formal, reality is an uncoordinated thing to perceive. Um, but in our world, you have to coordinate with each other. You have to get lost and say, my turn to look at Derek, no, my turn to look at Derek to get a stable read. And that's, that's just not how it works. Action uh, it is separate from perception, but in OO, it's complected. What about a Java interface tells you that you're going to do an action on something rather than perceive something? There's nothing about, there's no way to specify that. There's no, no way you can communicate to the, uh, the program that's going to happen. Identity. Uh, clearly, I've made the argument that 
there are snapshots which are different from the identity. They're emitted. But in oh, there's just there's no separation. You have this thing that's changing from underneath you, and you can't get a stable snapshot that you can have for as long as you want, where that won't have its um, its properties change. So immutable thing is what I'm trying to say. Interesting part here: uh, expiration authority. Um, in reality, um, the perceiver is the one that gets to decide when the thing you looked at is no longer valid. I look at you and close my eyes, and it's up to my visual memory when that is no longer valid. When my memory is obscured. But it, oh, the thing being perceived has control, which is an inversion, because you can say uh, you have this window of time within this lock, and that's the only valid time to look at me and get that perception. Um, that's that's pretty off. And finally, the semantics of the time model. In reality, we are all subject under the same time model. I can't do anything that you can under the same time. Um, but an oh, unfortunately, it's a roll your own. Um, you have to acquire this lock at this time to read this thing for this window of time. And if you have two different systems that have different time model locking semantics, you can't compose those things. Reuse is just totally broken in that sense. So I'm not just going to complain about it. Um, closure has what's called the ethical time model. And I was very intimidated by this when I saw it at first, but it makes a lot of sense now. I think I can explain it. So time flows from left to right. Uh, the Vs represent values that are transformed to new values by F, which is a pure function, any pure function. So that's very straightforward. We're just transforming things. But the time semantics, the identity, those concurrency primitives that I was mentioning earlier, they're the dotted box around the outside. Rich has already decided what it means to be, for something to have identity, what the rules are for communicating with it. That's not your problem anymore. We removed incidental complexity. So as an observer, you can simply perceive without anyone else getting in your way. It's uncoordinated, and you only get a stable value. Something that doesn't change, a snapshot that you can just look at. This is how Clojure got time right, and most other languages got it wrong. Interesting to note, f is a pure function. How easy is it to test pure functions? It's very easy. It's the best thing ever. So suddenly we can actually test concurrency. Um, and if you're on the border <laughs> about whether you like this or not, think of this in terms of Git. Uh, the v's are commits, and the f's are the transformations of the repository. We already love this, and our developer tools are awesome. They usually get time right. But what do we deliver to the customer? We, uh, we give them things that update in place and destroy the paths. We're just screwing them. Um, so we need to get our dev tools more in line with what we actually produce for people. So off of my soapbox and on to another one. <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about this enough, and this isn't like directly related to Clojure, but it's really what embodies it. So think about what you value in your languages and your tools and in your frameworks. Because we hear about new things all the time, and we make decisions based in seconds about whether we like it or not. Um, so let's be a little explicit about what we're subconsciously doing. Some of the criteria that we make these decisions are on um, easiness in the proper definition that I introduced earlier. Um, we take things that are cognitively near us, regardless of whether or not the right solution, every time. And a prime example of this is JSON. When is the last time you hesitated to use anything but JSON to make two systems work together? Probably haven't. There are other data formats like Eden and Avro and Hesher and Protocol Builders, and the list goes on and on that most people never know about that have different characteristics that make them the right solution for uh, different times. Um, and the other really nasty part about this is that familiarity will hide complexity. Um, regardless of whether you acknowledge it or not, it's still there. Popularity, which sounds like I, I don't do that, but as soon as something hits the top of Hacker News, everyone's using it without being discerning about whether it was a good thing or not. No one has conversations about these explicit things on like the comment section of Hacker News. Well, it gives you this, but uh, the ramifications are that this, this, and this. You know? That's just that's not something that people do. Availability. We love to get things on our machine in five seconds or less, which is I'm not I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but it lets you jump to things that are maybe just not correct. Um, we need to be more deliberate about what we're actually choosing. And I think the hackathons seriously embody this. Um, hackathons are everywhere, and which the point is to build something in 24 hours. But you never see the opposite, which is build a good thing over a long period of time. If you can never produce something with quality for as much time as you want, how are you going to do it when it's crunch time? It's never going to happen. Terseness and pretty syntax. So I already, I already told you about how data is an objectively simpler thing. 
But syntax is about you. This is about your enjoyment of what you're doing, when it should really be about the software. The customer doesn't take your source code and look at how there's no semicolon. That's, that's not what happens. Um, they don't care about that. Verbosity and terraces, it just doesn't matter. I hate hearing that complaint about Java. That's not the problem. It's about simplicity. Uh, it complex too many things together. Powerful. I don't know what this word means anymore because you can look up any language you want and you'll find the adjective parallel, powerful rather, um, after the language description. Please don't use this word for about a decade until that meaning runs out. Awesome. Everything that we talk about, we call awesome, but we don't actually say, here are the trade-offs. Um, maybe this isn't so awesome. So I'm, you know, I'm not trying to like rant on anything or say that all these things are bad. What I'm trying to get at is that simplicity should be the center of your value system. This should be what you care about, something that can take the problem space apart. And moreover, we need to care more about the program and not the program. It's not about our comfort. It's about producing something with craftsmanship and quality that actually works. Like I said, I really feel that we are not nearly as hard enough on ourselves as we should be. Um, so Rich gave a talk at a Closure West conference a few months ago, and he said, what if every time you download a library, your hands got blisters like a musician would learn a new instrument? How many of us would be hanging around still learning that new library language? I think very few. We give up so easily on things that are potentially really, really powerful. What? I use powerful. Crap. You do that. <laughs> you, you can't introduce words and then use them like that. Uh, anyways. Um, I lost my train of thought. Yeah. Blisters. Like <laughs> anyways. I truly believe that everyone sitting in this room gets it. That simplicity should be the thing. We should be worrying about the, product, the quality of the product. But we never seem to have time. It's always we need to ship it. But for people in this room, except for Lutz, we're like 20 years old and we're going to be doing this for 40 years, so I'd prefer to get it right now. Okay, so I'm pretty much finished. That was pretty fast. Uh, you, I want to preempt some things, which are, uh, yeah, FP, functional programming and closure are hard if you're coming from an O background, and you will struggle. But that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, if you're worried about the language proper, parentheses, they bother you. Uh, there's this thing called pair edit that everyone who has a problem with parentheses never seems to know about. It's easier to manipulate S expression based structures than it is lines. Um, don't worry about it. Don't let that stop you. Are the libraries in Clojure any good? Uh, yeah, they're, they're actually pretty deep. Um, but the kicker is that we can call into Java, which has the deepest libraries of any ecosystem out there. So now we have all closures and all Javas. So it's fantastic. Um, is, does anyone actually use this thing? Yeah, it's about the size of the Scala community. So you kind of know everyone. Um, and everyone in this community is really intelligent. It's so much fun to be a part of. Um, things you might miss are for loops and classes and types. Uh, but I already made the argument that it's, it's about the ability to reason. And more on the type thing, this is from the Chromium source code, I saw this and I was inspired. Uh, as you create more types for your system, you have more code. And there's a fact of life. If you have more code, you're going to have more bugs. Um, you can just use vectors and maps and sets to represent data. It works just fine. I know it's like scary that you're not naming your data all the time, but it ends up working out okay. So that's all I got, and I want to end with this quote. I think programmers have become a nerd's incidental complexity. When they encounter complexity, they consider it a challenge to overcome rather than as an obstacle to remove. Overcoming complexity isn't work, it's waste. So uh, if you want to watch those talks, there they are. I highly recommend watching them multiple times. There are so many subtle points that will make you very good at what you do. If you want to learn closure from a book, those books are good. But if you want to try closure right now, there's a REPL online. And that's all I got, unless you have questions. So, <laughs> so when you're talking about some of the problems of OO, you mentioned how um, extends is bad. The idea that you are intrinsically linked to some other object. Um, and that, you, that polymorphism is a better way to approach that. How do you have polymorphism without extending something in the first place? So they don't have this in Java, but you have the ability, they're called protocols in Clojure, to have an interface that is composed with the, the data data type that you're using technically, so that you can have them and they can talk to each other but never know about each other. 
It's like lost over composition, which is how you have two things that work together but never know about each other. So like functions f and g, which take one argument. So you can't have f of g of x. f and g don't know about each other, but they can still work together. Does that make sense? Yeah, but then I guess like, is polymorphism a different idea than enclosure? Or? So it's all about dispatch, not as much about an interface, I guess. Maybe I need to show you a code sample to make that work. Um, Possibly. Yeah. Sure. Is sure the dynamic dispatch code example? I don't, I don't have one. Okay. I, I purposely have no code in this talk because it's about like it's about thinking and making deliberate decisions, and I don't want to get into like, ooh, look at the code can do this. That's, that's not the point. <laughs> So you likened using a new library to learning an instrument. What is writing a library in that metaphor? I didn't give a talk. I didn't. I actually. I saw. I saw the notes of someone who was at the talk. I haven't even seen it yet, but I saw that point. And I was like, "Wow, that is, that is so true." I don't know. We, we get it. <laughs> so presumably, um, when it comes to time, you still want to schedule actions one after another, right? Mm, yeah, but. And you could probably do that with like flags and things like that, right? It's like, well, I also glossed over that. I was hoping that somebody would like pick up on it. So say you want to bash things together. It has transactions. And they are so simple to use. You just have these statements and say, surround with a transaction, and boom, they're, they're automatically atomic. And it's that easy. And if you have something that you're updating inside, uh, should be inside a transaction, and it's not, you get a compile error. So you're guaranteed safety, really. There are no deadlocks either. Michael, you, you're obviously an evangelist here. When did you get, when did you start learning about closure and what is it that sort of pushed you over the edge? Two years ago, um, and I think, I think the time thing really sold me. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I, I worked a lot to try and make that like condensed. Um, bit. Yeah. Cool. I hope I changed some lives tonight. <laughs> <laughs> For better or worse. So let's let's say for a second that I completely agree with you. I want to jump on board, but I don't want to use closure. How can I take some of these ideas and practices into uh, a more standard language like Java or C plus plus? Make all your data immutable. You can be able to do a movie if you're careful. Yeah, that too. You have more ideas on that? I haven't thought about it much. Well, yeah, I mean, Ruby, I mean, Ruby does all the things. Nobody in Ruby, no Ruby programmer writes for. Dot each, dot collect, dot select, yeah. you know, I mean, that sort of thing, right? Which is the same basic notion of, of applying a function and getting something back to which you can apply another function. Um, it's tougher, it's, it's really tough in C, and for all the reasons we've been talking about in 250, is you have to do your own memory knowledge, your own other garbage, and they, it gets in the way, you know. Um, now, there's, re I, you know, there's reason why. Things are done in C, uh, proficiency is done. But you know, once you've gone that way, you basically cut yourself off on a lot of these, these ideas. Very different. Yeah, I mean, the reason everyone went to Java from C is manual memory management. That's what you know broke the camel's back. Now it was concurrency. I'm yeah. fed up with concurrency and locks, and I don't want to do it anymore. Um, it's simple here. It's what do you think of really? It's pretty <laughs> easy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, concurrency is easy here. Yeah. You can't do that. 